tree and it whispers draw for that. Go ahead and take your Bibles tonight if you would go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter number 4 tonight. First Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> we'll look down here at verse number 15. 1 Timothy 4, verse 15, the Bible says, Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Father, I pray that you would be with the message tonight. I pray that you would challenge us. Lord, stir our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you draw us to you. And I pray, Lord, that we would take steps that would draw us closer into fellowship with you tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the great songwriters of, our, of the era gone by, and who was also in his own right a great preacher, J. Wilbur Chapman, had a great opportunity to go over to England to visit uh, the world-renowned at that time, uh, General William Booth. Uh, most of us know General Booth because of his great work with the Salvation Army. And uh, to us today in the 21st century, we usually think of the Salvation Army as being those folks who show up around uh, between Thanksgiving and Christmas time and stand outside with the red kettles and ring bells and uh, see if they can't get you to drop a dollar or two into the red bucket to uh, give to some folks who are hurting. And while that was part of General Booth's uh, mission, that was not his main mission. He called it the Salvation Army for a reason. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it wasn't just to save people from the poor parts of England, but it was to save their soul and to draw them to Jesus Christ. J. Wilbur Chapman had an opportunity to go over and to sit down with General Booth and have a conversation with him. And in that conversation he wrote these words down that General Booth had given to him. He said this, he said, I will tell you the secret, talking about his success with the Salvation Army. God had all there was of me to have. There have been greater men with greater opportunities. But from the day I got the poor of London on my heart and a vision of what Jesus Christ could do, I made up my mind that God would have all there was of William Booth. And if there is anything of power in the Salvation Army today, it is because God has had all the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. Chapman came to this conclusion after his visit, I learned from William Booth that the greatness of a man's power is the measure of his surrender. And well, what an amazing statement. And we look back on men like General William Booth and, and many others like him, and we say, wow, what, what amazing people. Boy, what an amazing person that, that man had. Boy, that man must have just had just a unique uh, power from God on high. But the reality is this here, the only difference between us and General Booth is surrender. Surrender. What does God have of us? Take your songbooks if you would. Keep your Bibles open. We're not going to preach from the songbook. But I do want you to look at number 287 in your songbook. It is a song that we sing oftentimes, or at least here played, during the invitation. And sometimes as we sing the song, if we're not careful, we fall into the trap of just singing through verses of these here. We don't consider the words. Judson DeVenter wrote these words down. He said this, All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. All to Jesus I surrender, humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me Jesus, take me now. All to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy Thine. May the Holy Spirit fill me, may I know Thy power divine. All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessings fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. How many times have we sung that song? How many times have we heard that song played during the course of an invitation time? And, and uh, I can remember from time to time whenever uh, Brother Parker would uh, uh, have the uh, invitation extended. Um, there were times whenever I remember we would sing all four verses and then we would do it again. And it was not unusual for us to go through that song many, many times because he felt like there was still unfinished business to be done. But all I, you know, as I, as I thought about those words, as, as I was thinking about the message tonight, and as I was listening to the songs uh, ble being, being played, I was thinking of the song that Miss H was playing on the piano for the offertory. You know, and, and then the uh, song the Borners just sang for us. Surrender, 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 surrender. It's, it's, it's being pressed upon us tonight, this idea of being surrendered. Verse 15, there we're going to take the middle phrase tonight, and I know you may be sitting there scratching your head saying, I don't know how in the world Pastor has done this, but he has now squeezed out 12 messages from four verses. And part of that reason is because Paul here, if you will, I kind of like it goes back to uh, somehow Paul did with the Thessalonians in First Thessalonians, Thessalonians chapter five. There was a bunch of just real fast little statements made at the end of First Thessalonians five, and uh, and they're just little fast things to think on. This is kind of the same thing with Timothy. Timothy, you need to be an example to believers. 
Let me challenge you, Timothy, to be an example of believers in your words. Let me challenge you, Timothy, to be an example of believers in your conversation and the way you live your life. Timothy, you need to be an example of the believers in the way you show love. Timothy, you need to be an example of the believers in your spirit. You need to be an example of the believers in, the, in your faith, that the people see you live by faith. Uh, you need to be an example of the believers in your purity. Now, Timothy, if you're going to accomplish these things here, there are some things you must do. First off, you must give yourself to reading. And not just any old reading, uh, you know, go down to your library and join up with the book reading club and see if you can read 100 books in the summertime. He is not what he's talking about. But give yourself to reading the scriptures. Uh, Timothy, give yourself here uh, to, uh, to exhortation. Get around whenever uh, there is opportunity to be exhorted in the Word of God. Get somewhere uh, whenever you have that opportunity and let yourself be exhorted, but also in turn make sure you're exhorting others to do the same thing. Doctrine. Give yourself to doctrine. If you have an opportunity to learn, to be taught some things, get in there and learn those things that God has for you, but then turn around and be a teacher of others as well. Teach others those things. Give yourself to those things. Now, Timothy, don't neglect the gift that is within you. Don't forget what God has called you to do. And let me just go back and reiterate this again. won't re-preach this here, but every single one of us in this room, we have a calling. If you're saved in here tonight, God has equipped you with some gift uh, to, be a, uh, to be a help to the body of Christ, and you are to be fulfilling your calling. You say, Pastor, I don't know what it is. Then you need to find out what it is. You need to go and you need to examine and see and ask God, Lord, what is it you want me to do? God has a place for every one of us to serve. For Timothy, it was to serve as the pastor of the church. He said, we have laid your hand, the presbytery, the, uh, the, uh, the fellow preachers there, they have laid their hands upon you. He said, I have laid my hands upon you. I know you are called to the ministry. So Timothy, preach the word. Uh, he tells him in 2 Timothy 4, uh, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Timothy, don't forget the uh, the, the gift that you have within you. And then uh, uh, two weeks ago we looked at this here to meditate upon these things. To think on these things. Tonight it is this. Give thyself wholly to them. Give thyself wholly to them. Notice that word holy, if you will, in your Bible. Notice the spelling of it. It is not H-O-L-Y, talking about the holiness of God, but rather it is W-H-O-L-L-Y. And the idea there is to give thyself wholly to them, to, to give everything you have. That's why I shared that story with you about uh, General Booth, because that's exactly what God got from General Booth. He got all of him. The Christian life cannot be lived half in, half out. The Christian life cannot just be lived on Sunday. When Jesus called for His disciples to follow Him, He didn't make it easy. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25, Jesus said it this way, Then said Jesus unto His disciples, If any man will come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for My sake shall find it. That cross that we look at tonight that's up here on our, uh, the center of the, of the platform for us, it's nice and glossy, very smooth, just a, a symbol to us. But in that day and age, whenever somebody brought up the cross, it would send uh, just terror in their hearts. The thought of the cross would be something, it doesn't even compare to how we would do capital punishment, how little it gets done, but the little bit that does get done, whether it's through the electric chair or through uh, the injection, a, a lethal injection, uh, those things, while yes, they are terrible because they take away life, they're not severe. Crucifixion was not uncommon for it to take two or three days. Just hanging on that cross. Six inches, typically six inches from the ground. That's how close you were to being able to live. It was a mental game as well. 
And boy, they, the Romans had perfected this. They knew how to torture somebody miserably to the very last breath. And everybody understood this. They saw these because these crucifixions were not done back in some back room. They were not back, uh, done in private, but they were done publicly so that everybody would see it, so that everybody would understand, you do the crime, this is the end. And it is a terrible end. So when Christ said, if you're going to follow me, take up your cross. Well, that wasn't just death. That was a very difficult a very trying uh, thing to go through. This was not going to be easy. And so as a disciple of Jesus Christ, it's not going to be an easy thing. But here's what Christ wanted, though. He wanted everything. If you're not going to give me everything, then you can't be my disciple. Well, what a, what, a, what a challenge to all of us as we consider that. How in the world uh, can God come and expect of us to give Him everything? Here's why. He gave us everything. Yeah. Romans 12 says, it's just your reasonable service. It's just a reasonable thing to do, right? And so as he talks here to Timothy and as he challenges Timothy, he says, give thyself wholly to them. What's the great challenge here for the disciple? What's the great challenge for Timothy? What's the great challenge for us today? It's to surrender ourselves. It's to give ourselves wholly to the call to behave as a believer. Let's look at that tonight here just for a few moments and consider these things here. I'm going to use the word consecration tonight to help kind of just sum up this phrase, to give thyself wholly to them, to consecrate ourselves to the cause of Jesus Christ. The challenge is to give ourselves wholly to those things which will make us an example of the believers, to separate ourselves so that in every case, in every way, in every place, we are an example of the believers. So therefore, I must be constantly being given over to those things, and my mind must be on those things in order to accomplish what God would have me to do. That, that word consecration uh, carries it with it the idea of giving ourselves completely over to something. And that's what God is asking of us. If you're going to be an example of the believers, you must give yourself wholly to the things of the Lord. Because yes, if we're just part-time believer, part-time carnal, it, it sends a mixed message. In the Old Testament, <clears throat> after the Israelites were come out of the land of Egypt, of course, that final night, we've been looking at the life of Moses, and that, that final night as they got ready to leave out, and the death angel passed over, and he killed the firstborn in every one of the Egyptian homes, and uh, killed the firstborn of all the animals there as well in those same homes, that God said, here's what I want you to do to go forward, to be reminded of what I've done, is I want you to consecrate the firstborn of every male, uh, firstborn of every household is consecrated unto me. They were supposed to be set aside. They were supposed to be marked for God's service, if you will. Uh, God wanted them to be reminded that it is, don't forget what I did. Don't forget what I spared. They belong to me. I bought them by blood. And there was supposed to be a consecration of the, uh, of the, of the firstborn to to the Lord to be dedicated to Him. That idea of consecration has this uh, uh, idea to set something or someone apart for a special purpose. You know, every one of us in this world, if we are saved, if we're a believer, we have a special purpose. God has a special purpose with your life, and He wants to use you to shine the light of the gospel for somebody else. He wants to use you to show somebody this is what a believer looks like. Here's what a Christian looks like. And it's our responsibility, every single one of us, to be wholly given to these things. Are we wholly given to the things of the Lord, or are we sending the mixed message that, well, Sunday is God's day, but the rest of the week is my time? Are we sending the message that I'm, I'm wholly given over to the Lord, or I, uh, God gets some of my time, but I also get an equal share, and it's a 50-50 kind of a proposition? If we're sending that kind of message, then we're sending mixed signals to the world. This world is in desperate need to see the power of God once again on display. 
And it says, should be seen through the church. And those who sit in the pews of the church, does God, uh, let me back that, does the world see the power of God in the people who sit in the pew? Does God, does the world see the power of God from the pulpits of the churches of America? It's a reasonable thing for us to do, to give ourselves to the Lord. Romans 12, I mentioned already, but it says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In Romans chapter 6, verses 8 through 14, Paul again goes through and speaks there concerning the fact that because of what he has done for us, we need to give ourselves wholly to the, and God desires to have us holy. It is impossible for us to live the Christian life and to know the blessing of God without consecration. It's impossible. In Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 3, the Bible says this, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. So there's a commitment that, God, I'm going to serve you with my life. God, I want you to take me, use me. Here I am, Lord. I do whatever you want with me. The Bible says whenever you commit yourself to the Lord, you're going to walk in His ways. You're going to do the things He would have you to do. You're going to serve Him in such a way He is pleased with you. At that point is whenever He begins to establish our thoughts. He begins to give us discernment. He begins to give us direction, but not until then. See, uh, you understand, many times we are so interested in ourselves that we want to do some things in order for us to get the blessing of God. Wrong motivation. Some people give in order to get from God. Can I tell you, God doesn't play that game. Listen, giving is supposed to come from a, a heart of thankfulness and a heart of, of joy to say, Lord, I just want to be a part of things. I want to be a help and I want to uh, do what you would have me do. And it coming from a heart of obedience instead of a heart of desire of, from what James chapter 4 said, to consume it upon our own lust. That's, that's a big difference, right? And so God here says, I want you to, to give me your works. I want you to give me your life. That's the idea of commit thy works to the Lord is to give your life over to the Lord. And then he says, thy thoughts shall be established. How does that begin? Well, the first place it begins is this here is by dying to sin in our lives. You got to understand here uh, uh, that you, we have to understand that we still deal with sin every day of our life and it is up to us to die to those things, to make choices that we will cut off the sinful activity, we will turn our back on those things and follow wholly with the Lord. In Romans chapter 6 uh, we find there that Paul asked the question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's his answer? Verse number 2 says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? That's, that's what our job is, is to be dead to sin and not go after those things any longer. He continues on in verse 6 when he says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. That's because we're going to serve something. We're either going to serve sin or we're going to serve God. And if we don't die to sin, we will serve sin. That's what he's saying. He said, if we do not die to the sin, then we will not serve God because there is too much pull from our flesh for us to say, no, nah, today I'm going to do this here. We can't go back and forth. We've got to give ourselves wholly to the Lord. We've got to give ourselves wholly to those things. We've got to give ourselves wholly to the doctrine. We've got to give ourselves wholly to the reading of Scripture. Give ourselves wholly to the exhortation. Give ourselves wholly to the calling of God upon our life. Give ourselves wholly to our meditating upon the things of God. And we are to give ourselves completely over to those things. In chapter 6 of Romans and verse 11, he says this, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. They say, we've got to make a choice. We're going to be alive to something. 
And Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. There's a choice to be made. Yes, sir. What do you want to go after? This world is tantalizing. It, it appeals to the flesh. And we want to run after the things of the flesh. And we want to satisfy the flesh. And, and when we run after the flesh, we make a choice to ignore the things of God. And by, and by doing so, we are not giving ourselves wholly to them. And even though the Scripture says over and over again to give ourselves wholly to those things, we choose to disobey God. Every time we don't give ourselves wholly to them. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24, he says this, And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If you belong to Christ, you have died to the affections and lusts of the flesh. Colossians 3.3 3 reminds us here, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. That's where life is. That's where true life is at in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. He says this, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Yes, sir. Let's remind us why we are saved in the first place. Those stripes... Those stripes that as he was beaten uh, uh, for us and the blood uh, poured forth from his body, uh, he had those things put on him because of our sin. And you think about it whenever you understand that he bore uh, the, uh, the, the pain and the suffering of our sin. It should drive us to say, I'm going to be dead to sin. I'm going to die to sin. I'm going to turn my back on sin because that is in our, listen, that is within our choices now. The, uh, when Galatians 5 talks about t that we have liberty. <clears throat> The liberty is we can now turn away from sin. That's liberty. We now have a choice to either go after sin or to go after the things of God and to live for God. We have a choice now in the matter. Prior to salvation, there was no choice. Proverbs goes so far as to say that the plowing of the wicked, hard work, honorable man, upstanding person, even the plowing of the wicked is sin. Well, that sure seems unfair now, doesn't it? I've never once driven by, and uh, while we lived up in Trenton, we lived in farm country. I mean, there was beans and corn everywhere you can see. Brother Kenny, you're heading up that direction. You know, uh, you'll see all kinds of things going on with that. The corn will be nice and tall by the time he gets up there and uh, we start harvesting and things will get started up here pretty soon. And every once did I drive down the field and I saw some farmer out there in his, in his tractor plowing and getting things ready to go for the corn or the soybean or whatever he was planting. And every once did I say, sinner. Wicked, awful sinner out there driving a tractor, putting corn in the ground. Wicked sinner! Never once thought that. No. Always thought, man, there's, that, that's a hard working person right there. But you know what? God looks down if that person was not saved and he did not have his faith and trust in Christ and said, sin. Because he's relying on himself. Self sufficiency, don't need God. And see, God wants us to give ourselves wholly to Him. You say, well, what does God want from me? Let me give you some things tonight here quickly. What does God want from us? First off, He wants our bodies. Romans 12, 1, we've already quoted it, but that's exactly what it says. We need to present our bodies a living sacrifice unto God. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, he says this here, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God, when you got saved, he purchased the whole thing. Spirit, soul, and body, he took it all. And he said, hey, I bought that, and you need to give that to me. So tonight, what he doesn't want consecrated, he wants your body consecrated. Lord, take my life, let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Uh, we go down through, as the songwriter said, take my hands, take my feet, take my eyes, take my mouth, uh, take my ears, uh, take my heart. Lord, take it all. I'm giving all to you. That's what he says in 1 Corinthians 6. I'm giving everything to the Lord. It's consecration. He wants our bodies. He wants our families. 
He wants your spouse. He wants your kids. He wants your grandkids. He wants your family. In Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15 he says this, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me in my house, he didn't just say, and as for me, he said, as for me in my house, yes, sir. Mrs. Joshua, all Joshua Juniors and Juniorettes in there, yes, sir. you're all going to serve the Lord as long as you're under the, house, over the roof of this house. Amen. You're going to serve the Lord. We're not going to play that game of, of, of playing uh, footsie with the Canaanites. We're not going to play that game of, oh, I wish I could go back for the leeks and garlics uh, back in, uh, and the onions back in, uh, in Egypt. land. We're not playing that game in my house. Wash your mouth out with soap. Why? Because as far as we're concerned, this household, we're going to serve the Lord. And he said, listen, uh, God wants our families. And He wants us to give our families over to Him. Listen, young people, right now, be making those decisions that, uh, that Lord, one day when I get to uh, have my own family, Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to serve You with my family, and, and my, we're going to be in church together, and we're going to serve the Lord together in church. God, you got my family. My family's all yours. God says, I want those things. I, I deserve those things. He says, I want, our, I want your body. I want your family. He says, I want your will. I want your will. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So be not conformed to this world, but be trans transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Take God's will and make it yours. And in Psalm 40, verse 8, David said this, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. David said, Lord, I want your will and I want to do your will. See, I'm, I'm turning my will over to your will. In Psalm 143, verse 10, David said this here, Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God, thy spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Why did David say that? Because he wanted his will to be in line with God's will. God, take my will, make it thine. Then Matthew chapter 12 and verse 50, uh, the Bible says there, For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. What an example that Christ gave us, right? In Matthew 26, verse 42, when He said, He went away again the second time, talking to the time in the Garden of Gethsemane, and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, Thy will be done. Yes, sir. See, the prophet Isaiah, as he stands before God, Here am I, Lord, send me. Yes, sir. Whatever you want, Lord, here I am. That's what God wants. He wants our bodies. He wants our families. He wants our will. He wants our future. He wants our future. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 20 through 26, we have a wonderful set of scriptures there of Paul explaining to the believers at Philippi that regardless of what happens to him, uh, whether he lives or dies, he doesn't care because uh, he's just he's in the hands of the Lord, and the Lord has his future. He says it this way in verse 21, familiar to us, for to me to live is Christ. You know what that is? That's your future. Lord, whatever the future is, I'm going to live for you. I, you have my future, and to die is gain. That was future as well. Yeah. Lord, whatever you want, you've got my future. God wants our future. Every one of us in this room, we have a future. Yes, Some year, your future may be shorter than others. But that doesn't matter, though. Today, we've had almost up to this point here, we're at about, I don't know, about 19 hours of the day is gone now. We still have five more hours in this day, and if the good Lord's willing, tomorrow you'll get another fresh set of 24. What are you going to do with that set of 24 tomorrow? See, that, that's our future for me to live is Christ. Uh, he wants our rights. In Romans chapter 12, verse 19, the Bible says this, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Take my hands off. 
Lord, I'm just going to let things, let you take care of things. You can look at these verses yourself too, but 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 15, that entire chapter is about us taking aside and setting our, side, our rights aside and giving them over to the Lord. In the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10, it's about letting the Lord have His way. And Lord, whatever you want, uh, specifically verse 4, God, I'm giving you my rights. He wants our position. We think we have to have position. We think we have to have a name, we have to have a title, we have to have all these things. But here's what Christ says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Vain glory is, don't you know who I am? Yeah. My brother would get in trouble in town, he would always you throw that thing out. Don't, do you know who my dad is? <laughs> that line got used a lot in town. Don't you know who my dad is? You know what God says? I ain't interested who your dad is. I want you to give that position up. He says this here, but, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. No, brother, you're better than me. Lord, no, no, no. You, you take it. You do it. No, I, no, I insist. Listen, yeah, you uh, preferring, uh, in honor, preferring one another is what the Bible tells us in the book of Psalms. He goes on to say in verse 4 of Philippians 2, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Have it a mind that considers everybody else. So I am not, listen, do you not know who I am? Don't you know that I've got this position, that position, and I'm this and that and everything else? God says, yeah, we, we lay, you give those things over to me. Let me have that. Our reputation. Philippians 2, 7. But made himself of. No reputation. <sighs> Look at that. It's over there eating with publicans and sinners. We would never do that. He made himself a no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant, was made in likeness of men. I don't know if we completely understand the gravity of that last statement. He was made in the likeness of men. We think we're something else, don't we? But the God of the universe, the Creator, the one who put all these things together, who holds it all together, decided to robe that divinity into flesh and laid aside His divinity. You think of the worst place you could go in this world. I mean, to the, to, the, to the poorest of the poor, to uh, no running water and no, uh, I mean, just you, you go through it and you think of what is the worst, I mean, just the, the worst possible situation. And that pales in comparison to what Christ did when he left glory to come to live on this earth. No reputation. No reputation. He wants our reputation. He wants our possessions. Romans, or I'm sorry, Matthew 13, verse 22, he says, He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. God doesn't want us to get caught up in trying to gain all that the world has, but instead leave those things aside and don't let those things choke out the work of God in our hearts. He wants our possession. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. Remember this here. He make, makes mention of this here. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. God says, I, I want you to give me your possessions. Let me have them. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8, Paul said, Yea, Dallas, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Listen, don't let, don't let possessions get a hold of you. Don't let the things of this world grab hold of you and turn you away from your Lord. Listen, God says, I want you to give me those things here. Lord, here it is. These are yours. You do what you want to. Remember that rich young ruler who came to Jesus that day? Lord, what must I do to, receive, uh, to enter into uh, to heaven one day? Uh, what do I have to do to receive eternal life? And he goes through all the commandments and he goes down one by one. And he's, he, he gets down and he says, I've kept them all, Lord. I've kept everything you've told me to do. He says, the, the one thing thou lackest, go sell all that I have and come and follow me. 
And it says the young man went away sorrowful because he had, a, he, was, he, had, he had much riches and he couldn't give of the possessions over to the Lord. Consecrated. We look in the Word and we find these who were consecrated to the Lord and hear what the Lord says about them. Caleb and Joshua in Numbers 32 and verse 12, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, uh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. They had given the Lord everything they had. They, they had given uh, everything. They were an example of the believers in their words, the things they were saying about the Lord. They were an example of the uh, believers in their conversation and the way they had lived their lives. They were an example of the believers in their faith, and they trusted God completely. Uh, they, were, they had given themselves wholly to the Lord, and now they were wholly following Him. And Josiah uh, and the Israelites in 2 Kings chapter 23 in verse 3 the Bible says, And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep His commandments and His testimonies and His statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in the book. And all the people stood to the covenant. Yes, sir. They all said, we're going to do it. We're going to keep all of it. God's got all of us. Asa. And the people of Judah in 2 Chronicles 15, verse 15, And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart, and sought him with their whole desire. And he was found of them, because they were wholly consecrated to the Lord, and the Lord gave them rest round about. Again, Paul, Philippians 3, 7 through 8, he says there in verse 7, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. I give all things to God. So what's the challenge for us? In Acts chapter 11, verse 23, the Bible says that they heard there was, that God was doing a great work there in the, in the place of Antioch there. And so the disciples uh, sent Barnabas up there to check in on him, see what was going on. And Barnabas came and he preached to him and he challenged him. And at the end of verse 23, he said this here, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Has given themselves wholly to the Lord to follow after Him with all their might. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 6, Paul challenged the believers there that as they were out in their, in their workplaces and they were living their lives not to, uh, to, to serve uh, those and, and to give all they had, not with eye services, men pleasing, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Give every, hey, listen, give your heart to those things. Oh, that's not in church, that's not spiritual. It's more spiritual than you realize. Everything you do should be given for the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says this here, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything. D.L. Moody was a great evangelist. We read his stories. We hear about what, how God used him. He had traveled over to England to, for, some, uh, for some preaching, and while he was there, he uh, took the opportunity to sit under some preaching himself. He heard uh, the man uh, that was preaching there, a man by the name of Henry Varley. How many have heard of that preacher? He's not as popular as D.L. Moody, is he? Not as popular as Spurgeon. But Henry Varley was preaching this one night, and D.L. Moody was sitting in the service, and during the course of that, that message, he made this statement, and many of us have heard this. He said, the world has yet to see what God will do with a man fully consecrated to him. Sometime later, Moody met Varley, and he told him the impact of those words on him. He told him this here. He said, those were the words sent to my soul through you from the living God. As I crossed the wide Atlantic, the boards of the deck of the vessel were engraved with them. And when I reached Chicago, the very paving stones seemed marked with them. Under the power of those words, I have come back to England, and I felt that I must not let more time pass until I let you know how God had used your words to my inmost soul. A million souls turned to Christ later. All because a man took a challenge. The world has yet to see what God can do with a man wholly consecrated to the Lord. God's desire for His children is to consecrate themselves to Him, to consecrate themselves to His holy statutes. God is not looking for part-time believers. He's looking for full-time Christians. And as we give ourselves to think on His Word and yield to His Spirit, it will come through the way we live, consecrated lives, 
given wholly to them. Timothy, you need to be an example of believers. And the way it's going to happen is you're going to have to give yourself wholly to these things. It's on your mind constantly. You're trying to live it out every moment of your life. Timothy, be an example of the believers. Give yourself. Christian, although the words were written almost 2,000 years ago, they still ring true. The need for us to be wholly given to these things so that we can be an example of what a true believer is. What are you consecrated unto tonight? When we sing the song, All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. Is it true? Or is it just a melody we know? Words are hollow in our lives. Father, help us tonight.